All right, welcome to the uh, second half of the College 12 Pack for this week. We're getting you ready for week 10. As always, I am your host, Patrick Con. With me uh, on screen there is uh, Tyler from Spartansburg. Oh, wait, sorry, I'm not using your fake name. Tyler Natuno of LSU Tigers Wire. Uh, you know I had to work in a uh, Spartansburg reference there, Tyler. I know you spent some time in South Carolina recently, so... It, it, it added up way too well, but apparently somebody actually did figure out who this Tyler from Spartansburg was, which I thought was quite quite humorous. Uh, but jokes aside, we're getting you ready for week 10. Big matchups. We have the Big 12 semifinals, essentially, and the SEC semifinals. We're going to get into that in a little bit later. Of course, the big news, Tuesday night, Halloween night, CFP reveal, we finally get the top 25 rankings, and Tyler, as we dive into this, let's start off with too high, too low. Uh, obviously, we know who may be shocking to some people, but I predicted this, Ohio State, the number one team in the CFP rankings. But there might be another OSU that you think is a little too high. Yeah, I mean, you. I'll give you credit on that one. You called the Ohio State number one thing. I'm not like shocked by it, but um, I, I'm a little bit surprised. I, I thought it would be Georgia just because of of the way that you know the, the other polls have looked and stuff. But yeah, you got that one. Um, but yeah, looking at who's too high, I've got Oklahoma State, um, who they sit at 22. You know, a team that we talked about on the show Monday. You know, a team that's taken a lot of strides in the right direction. You know, started the year off playing really not very well you know lost 33 to 7 at home to south al they're playing much better football right now um thanks in large part to a guy we talked about ollie gordon with that being said you know i think including them in these initial rankings was a little bit surprising to me especially when you look at the teams they're ahead of um you know they're above kansas state which they beat them you know they beat kansas state in stillwater so so you know i understand two teams with the same record giving the edge to Oklahoma state. I still think Kansas state has the more impressive resume though. And then you also look at they're ranked ahead of um, seven and one Tulane, whose only loss is to Ole Miss. Who's a very good team. And they're also ahead of uh, eight and no air force. You know, I think one of these two uh, Oklahoma state, Kansas state teams probably would have been left out um, if James Madison was postseason eligible. So they're not the the CFP is is disregarding James Madison since they can't get into the playoff regardless. So that's just something to keep in mind. That's a team that would probably be in this top twenty five um, in another poll. But yeah, I think Oklahoma State. I'm a little surprised they cracked the initial rankings. Let's talk about my team that I think is way too high. USC Trojans check in at number twenty. Why are they even ranked? When you look at what they've done the last five weeks, they're three and two, giving up an average of forty three points per game and. Uh, California looked like they had an all-world offense uh, when it came to uh, what they showed on the field. You know, it's very reminiscent, and I think it's funny because Lincoln Riley has ties to Lubbock, Texas, obviously being backup quarterback to Cliff Kingsbury and also being on the staff to Mike Leach. This feels like a Texas Tech Red Raiders offense or a team in general that I saw growing up. No defense whatsoever. I guess the, the best defense is a really good offense. Yeah, I mean, it's been a tough stretch for USC. I still, you know, I, I I understand including them in the rankings. You know, I think I don't think there's necessarily 25 teams that I think are are better than USC right now, um, even with their very clear flaws because of what they do offensively. You know, could have easily lost that game to Cal, um, and that's certainly one way to look at it. But you know, you could also look at it and say that you know they lose that game with probably any other quarterback or any other offense. So. I mean, that that offense does keep them in any game. I mean, I think that's, you know, unless unless it's like what happened against Notre Dame where Caleb throws three interceptions, which I'm not saying that can't happen, but he's never had a game like that um, before or since. I, I don't really expect it to happen again. Um, you know, I think when you look at, you know, other two lost teams, I think you could argue that Kansas has a stronger resume now that they have that Oklahoma win. I mean, that's better than anything that <clears throat> USC can claim right now. I think you could argue that Kansas State's better. I think you could argue, you know, Oklahoma State's better even maybe in addition to, you know, Tulane and Air Force. So I'm a little surprised they're as high as they are. I'm not really surprised they are are ranked, though. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it, top 25 is not exactly a stretch. But I, I think when you look at the teams that they're ahead of, there can be arguments, like you said, for Kansas, Oklahoma State, Kansas State, Tulane. Uh, who beat them head-to-head last year in the Cotton Bowl. Obviously a different team, but 
I digress. Uh, let's talk about too low. And uh, I'm going to go with a team that beat USC this year. I'm going to go with Notre Dame. I kind of feel like they're a little bit too low when you look at what they've done this year. Uh, look at that game, that dismantling against USC. Uh, watched them last week against Pittsburgh. Just absolutely annihilated them. They had a pick six return for a touchdown, fumble return, punt return, running game. The thing that I really like about Notre Dame, and yes, they have really they've had a really tough schedule this year with some of their losses. Obviously, one, their one big loss came against Ohio State, who was ranked number one. Uh, but you look at what at what all else they have done. I you, I really think that they have a resume that I would put them closer to the top ten than where they are at number fifteen. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what pretty much everything you just said. I was about to make some of those same points myself. You know, I think on pay, you know, the, the way this team is, is playing right now, I think they are a top 10 team. Um, and that schedule has been absolutely brutal. You know, I think this is a better team than seven and two would have you believe, um, especially when you consider that they very easily could have won that Ohio State game. Um, you know, they had a real chance to and, and it looked like they were going to. So, you know, I, I, we're talking about this Notre Dame, very, uh, this Notre Dame team very differently if they win that game. You know, the other loss, you know, Louisville, we'll see exactly how good they are, but they're clearly a pretty good team. Um, and that was kind of the game where they had their coming out party. So that kind of thing just happens sometimes. You know, it was on the road. I, I don't read too much into it. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to justify that they should be ranked significantly higher than they are just because they are the highest ranked um, two loss team. You know, so you'd have to jump them over someone like Missouri or the Louisville team that beat them to move them up significantly higher. Or I'm sorry, they're not the high. Sorry, they're not the highest ranked uh, set two loss team. Actually, I'm wrong about that. They're the second highest behind LSU, who I think you could have a real argument that they should be ahead of LSU. You know, LSU, a team that's we'll talk about later in the show, playing good football right now, but they don't really have the signature win, um, and they've you know struggled in a couple losses. So, I mean, I think I think Notre Dame has the best resume of any two loss team in the country by far. Um, no, no disagreements there. Yeah, so let's get into the team that you have as too low. We've talked about mine. Uh, who are you going with here, Tyler? Yeah, this was honestly really the only qualm I had with the top 10. Um, I, I think they had Texas one spot too low. Um, I personally would have put – we agreed on this uh, in, our, in our projections on Monday. I would have put Texas at six uh, over Oregon. Oregon obviously came in at six. Look, I get it. I mean, I, I spent 10 minutes on the show Monday talking about how good I think this Oregon team is. And we have questions about Texas, especially without Quinn Ewers. Um, but, you know, Texas has arguably the most impressive win in the country, you know, going on the road and beating Alabama, an Alabama team that's only played better since then. Um, you know, so I think that looking at, you know, the resume, you know, Oregon's loss slightly better than Texas's, um, but still, I mean, hard to fault Texas too much for losing a game that was, you know, back and forth to a good Oklahoma team. Um, I mean, I, I personally, what, what bothered me with putting Texas at seven was to me, the logic that would lead you to put Ohio state at one over Georgia is the same logic that should lead you to put uh, Texas at six over Oregon. You know, I think, I think Georgia looks like a better team to me right now than Ohio State does, but you can't argue with the wins, and they have the most impressive wins in the country. I think in the same vein, Texas has more a more impressive win than Oregon and a stronger resume because of that. And considering these rankings seem to be mostly resume-based, that didn't really make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, it seemed like the resume-based decision was Ohio State. The eye test was Oregon. Uh, yeah. When you when you look at Oregon right now, I mean, if we had to put these two teams head to head, you'd probably lean Oregon because I think, no disrespect to Quinn Ewers, but I think Bo Nix is the better quarterback, and and I think Oregon has the better defense. Um, you could argue that they've got some better playmakers uh, when you look at at Texas, but I think usually in these type of games, the quarterback makes the biggest difference, and that's why I'd probably lean Bo Nix. But but again, uh, if I'm going to make the argument for Ohio State at number one, then I have to go with Texas at six because of the resume when you talk about it. Because if you look at Oregon, yeah, their, their one loss is a three-point loss against Washington who's been really good this year. They beat Colorado 42-6, to six, which I think people jumped on the Colorado wagon a little too early, um, and we saw what happened there. The same thing happened with Utah. Based on what Utah did against USC, people thought, okay, here goes Utah again. 
and then Bryson Barnes gets brought back down to earth. So I, I, you know, those are the the qualms I had, and the other qualms were being the head to head. The head to head clearly mattered with Texas and Alabama in their placement, but didn't matter with Texas and Oklahoma. You know, some other ones. How about Missouri over LSU? The head to head doesn't matter. So those are some of my qualms, but it's only week one, uh, and we're probably going to have this argument every week, but that's where we stand as far as the too high, too low. But as we're talking about Texas, let's talk. Let's jump into it. Big 12 semifinal to watch. We have Kansas State visiting Texas, and what's interesting about this, Tyler, is Texas is a team that has owned Kansas State over the last decade, winning eight of ten matchups. Uh, they're relatively close with the exception of that 2020 game when Texas dropped 69 on Kansas State. I think they were dealing with some some COVID issues for that game, but relatively close games, but it always seems like Texas has the leg up in this one. Yeah, that success is really impressive, too, when you like think about the fact that this Kansas State team feels like it, it's always gets someone. I mean, usually it's Oklahoma. I, I feel like they upset Oklahoma almost every time they play, but – um, I mean, yeah, you know, Texas has done really well in this series uh, recently. I, I think this is going to be a tough one, though. I mean, we've talked about it. You know, Kansas State really hitting its stride. You know, I think that's kind of what they always do. You know, they take a little bit to figure it out. But once they figure out, you know, their personnel, they, they just they destroy you. Um, obviously not going to do that this week against a, a, a Texas team that's more talented than them. But it makes things tough. And, you know, I think I lean towards Texas here just because, first of all, I, I really like their defense. You know, I think the defense is going to make things really hard for Kansas State to move the ball, even if Texas, you know, struggles to score in this game, which they could. You know, I, I think Malik Murphy last week was okay. I think he left a little bit to be desired with the way he played. I think we have some questions about what this team is going to look like without him. And this is, to me, the big game. You know, I think if you're – Operating under the assumption that Quinn Ewers would be back for any hypothetical uh, Big 12 championship rematch against Oklahoma, this is really the one where you know you've got it to keep your season alive and, and, and keep your playoff hopes alive. You got to win this game without him. Um, it's going to be the big test. You know, I think I lean towards Texas mostly because of the defense, but I, I'd be lying if I told you I feel very confident about that. Yeah, I, I think I'm probably leaning Texas in this game. This is a tough one for me. Uh, just because Malik Murphy now, but we have, you know, I want to remind people Malik Murphy made his first start ever um, at, at the collegiate level last week against BYU. You know, he showed some things. He showed some things that made you go, okay, that that's definitely a freshman with some mistakes, but he made some plays. He got his first career touchdown pass in the game, but I think they're going to lean heavily on the run game with Jonathan Brooks, CJ Baxter. You know, I think that they can do some things as far as getting the book, the, the football out in space with a Donai Mitchell, uh, with Xavier Worthy, who also Worthy showed last week he can he can return punts as well uh, and, and put them in the end zone. But you talk about that defense. You know, I think Anthony Hill, another true freshman, who's coming along. They have Jalen Ford, who's one of the best linebackers in the country last year. I think they've got enough of the pass rush. They've got some guys on the back end who can make some plays. And the big thing, the reason why I would lean Texas is because we know that they can slow the run game down. And really, for Kansas State to be successful, they've got to be able to run the football with Will Howard, with DJ Giddens. And if they can't get that running game going, I don't know if they're strong enough throwing the ball down the field to beat Texas in this game. The other Big 12 matchup in this is what we could be seeing the final bedlam for quite some time with Oklahoma leaving to the SEC. And it seemed like Oklahoma State has no interest in scheduling Oklahoma in non-conference beyond this season since they are going to the SEC. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, kind of one of the one of the bigger casualties of, of conference realignment has been is, is this rivalry series. Um, it's a shame. You know, it's one of the best ones. It's weird that we're getting the last one, you know, first weekend of November. It's kind of usually more of a later season game, but um, is what it is. And, you know, like you said, it's setting up kind of interestingly. You know, it, it feels like we do kind of have a pair of Big 12 semifinals here. You know, I, I think this one I'm a little bit less – interested in to be honest with you i i think you know oklahoma state playing really well right now they've, they've been playing better and especially because of ollie gordon like i said earlier you know this isn't a great oklahoma run defense the defense overall has been pretty well they're a little bit vulnerable against the run which i think could work in oklahoma state's favor they're pretty good against the pass though and i think that's going to make things tough for alan bowman who 
you know, has secured this job. You know, they were doing a three quarterbacks, a three quarterback system earlier in the year. That wasn't really working. They've kind of finally settled on Alan Bowman. He still had his ups and downs, though. I think this is going to be a really tough game for them uh, against an Oklahoma defense is good. I think we'll see Oklahoma offensively play a little bit better than it has. I, I just I don't really think you'll see a sluggish game from them back to back games, especially with this one being a rivalry. You know, everything's that's at stake. You know, their their Big Twelve hopes probably over with a loss. Their playoff hopes almost certainly over with a loss. So I, I think I expect a bounce back game from Oklahoma, um, even though this one is in Stillwater, which does give it you know an added bit of intrigue, but I don't think Oklahoma State, despite the improvements, is really there yet to beat a team like this. This is going to be my bold prediction of the week. Ollie Gordon's going off in this game and Oklahoma State's winning. And the reason why is I look, I go back and look at what Oklahoma was doing last week. Uh, very much a very similar uh, going up against a team who was a strong running team in Kansas with Devin Neal, and not so strong at quarterback with Jason Bean. I kind of look at Alan Bowman in the same regard. Alan Bowman doesn't have the wheels that Jason Bean does, but I also think Ollie Gordon brings another dynamic uh, that Devin Neal didn't have. And we've seen that nobody's been really able to stop and slow down Oklahoma State. I think they knew do enough things defensively in this game to slow down that offense, and I think Oklahoma loses their second straight game, uh, which would probably be a surprise to some, giving – where the trajectory looked for the Sooner team a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not ruling out that possibility. Certainly, you know, I, I don't think, you, I don't think it's a given by any means. I just, I don't think you're going to see a letdown performance in back-to-back -back weeks from this Oklahoma team, especially considering they easily could have won um, at Kansas last week. I mean, they squandered some some significant opportunities in that game and had to dig themselves out of an early hole. I just doubt they they make the same kind of mistakes in this one. Um, and if they do, if they lose back-to-back -back games in that kind of fashion, that's pretty tough for Brett Venables. It, it will be pretty tough. Uh, but, you know, let's talk about SEC. Very similar situation, Tyler. When we talked about the Big 12 having two semifinal games, it looks like the SEC has something similar uh, in the game that you are very going to be very interested in, obviously, Alabama, LSU, and Tuscaloosa. LSU hasn't won against Alabama back-to-back -back years since 2011. Uh, that was a 9-6 final also in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, uh, you know, big one for us over on LSU Wire. You know, I mean, this is kind of a one-game season for LSU, you know. Win it, and I think everything's feeling good. Lose it, and it's a disappointing year too for Brian Kelly. I mean, they're probably going to finish nine and three again um, if they don't win this game, which is not really what anyone thought would happen with this team, with what they brought back. Especially considering the offense has been even better than I think anyone really thought it would be. You know, I, I think you know they're underdogs. Obviously, they're only a field goal underdog on the road in this game. Opened it like a, a touchdown underdog, so that's you know decreased pretty significantly. And I think there's a good reason for that. Look, um, this LSU team has flaws. There's no doubt about it. Defensively, a lot of question marks and coming into this game, they're going to be without their best defensive lineman and Makai Wingo who uh, underwent surgery, likely out for the year, definitely out for the regular season, probably out for the whole year. They're also going to be without their best corner um, in Zai Alexander, a transfer. Uh, he's out for significant time. It sounds like and they also don't have Deuce Chestnut or Denver Harris, two of their other transfer corner additions, are currently away from the program for reasons that haven't been disclosed, but they're not available. So point being, this Alabama or this LSU defense that's already struggling is shorthanded in this game, and that's a concern. But with all that being said, I still think this is actually a really good matchup for LSU. I think that Alabama's defense is the best it's played. And I think if they can follow the FSU formula of putting pressure on Jaden Daniels, uh, they'll have some success. I think LSU's offensive line is playing better, though, than it was earlier in the year. I don't know if Alabama can slow this defense, this offense down. I'm not sure anyone can slow this offense down. And if you're getting into a shootout, I mean, if you tell me that LSU is going to score 30 points in this game, I don't know if I trust that Jalen Milrow can keep up with that in a shootout. Like I, I truly don't know. I think it'll be close. I have it. I think it's going to be a high scoring game, a one score game, but I just think LSU is the, is the better matchup here. I think they go win this game on the road. Yeah. This one's tough when you look at it, just because of how bad the 
defense has been for LSU this year, especially on the secondary, losing a lot of guys, obviously, like you've talked about. There is that concern. Jalen Milrose strikes me as a guy who can challenge this team down the field. I think he throws a pretty good deep ball. It's everything else that I worry about with him as the quarterback. Um, he can give you some runs. But again, like you said, uh, this is going to be a tough matchup. You know, this might feel similar to the Texas game earlier this year. And we saw what Quinn Ewers and the Texas Longhorns were able to do. Um, they, But they were able to slow an Ole Miss team down that looked pretty unstoppable early. Uh, you look, they did struggle uh, against an Arkansas team a few weeks ago that I didn't feel like had a very good offense. And if they fall behind like they did against Tennessee, I don't see that type of comeback for the simple fact that I just feel like LSU is just going to keep the pressure on. You know, if you look at offensively, I think they're better. Uh, that being said, um, I do think this is a close game, and I'm probably going to lean Alabama just because of that defense. I think they can make some plays, but I don't think this is going to be a low-scoring affair. I'm, I'm thinking both teams north of 30 points in this game. Yeah, I think the Texas game is a really good parallel here. And that's kind of why where I'm drawing the LSU pick from. Granted, Texas's defense is much better than LSU's. So that's going to hold LSU back. I do think, though, what LSU brings to the table out wide with Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas Jr. is something that uh, Alabama has just not had to deal with. I think even when you look at guys like A.D. Mitchell and Xavier Worthy, I'm not sure if that's as good of a unit as what LSU is going to bring to the table on Saturday. So... I, I, that is interesting to me, the way they gave up big plays against Texas. I will say Alabama receiver wise has some guys that are sort of starting to come into their own. You know, Jermaine Burton's played well in recent weeks. Isaiah Bonds, he's a young guy, played pretty well too. Again, with the DB depth being strained for this LSU team, that's a real concern. But I, I, none of those guys have really shown that they have like take over a game ability. And that's kind of what make, gives me pause. And LSU have struggled against dual threat quarterbacks. Milrow can run, but he's not a dual threat in the same sense that I would say like KJ Jefferson and Jackson Dart are. And those are the kind of guys that have really given this team issues. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's interesting you bring up Malik Neighbors, who might be the best wide receiver uh, on, in the country outside of Marvin Harrison and Keon Coleman. Uh, I do think that he will cause a lot of problems. And then Brian Thomas, obviously, with his size and ability to get down the field. One of the top duos in the country. Uh, I think they're going to do well in this game. Uh, but it remains to be seen how well they're going to do. Now, let's talk about Georgia-Missouri. Now, this is the game last year. Missouri kind of jumped up, and they gave, they gave uh, Georgia a, a huge bite. Georgia won that game only by four points, and I think we both agree that that Missouri team is much better than they were a year ago. Georgia obviously not having Brock Bowers can be a problem. I know that he they kind of flexed their muscles against Florida last week, uh, but I do think Missouri is a team that can really challenge this Georgia defense uh, offensively with Luther Burden and what Brady Cook's been doing. Yeah, this is a really intriguing game. It's kind of one that if I sort of sit there and squint my eyes a little bit, I can kind of talk myself into Missouri winning this game. Um, I mean, I think offensively, they're really explosive. I think, you know, with guys like Luther Burden, Theo Wees, they don't – I mean, Georgia hasn't really played a team like that that can test them. I mean, I mean, if you want to look at what Florida did last week, I mean, they had a little bit of offensive success. Not really, but they're also, you know, got guys like – you know, Ricky Pearsall, a decent slot receiver, uh, Eugene Wilson, a good young, you know, true freshman receiver, but nothing like that's going to compare to what, what Georgia is going to have to play this weekend. So I, I think that is a real concern, especially because I think we've seen Georgia be a little bit susceptible to, to some good offenses, you know, or even bad offenses. Auburn, Auburn did some things on them. So, you know, I, I think that is something to watch. I think Missouri's defense is better than people give it credit for. It's not a lead or anything, but it's solid. It's a solid defense to pair with a really good offense. So these are all reasons I could talk myself into it. I, I just, the way Georgia played last week, it didn't look like they missed Brock Bowers at all. You know, guys really stepped up uh, without him available. I, I just, I don't know. I think if Georgia's going to lose a game, I think it would be to Ole Miss. That, that to me looks like the more dangerous of those two, of the two tough ones they've got left in the regular season. I'd love to talk myself into this. I, I, I just don't think I see it. Um, You know, I, I did bring up the Brock Bowers issue, obviously. Uh, 
But no, I'm like you. I'm not talking myself into taking Missouri in this game. Uh, just the way that, that Carson Beck has played this year actually is a lot. He's been a pleasant surprise. I didn't know that he was going to be as good as he has been. They obviously have a two-headed monster uh, running the football, mostly by Dejan uh, Edwards. But really, when you look at this team, uh, they're stocked offensively. They're stocked defensively. Uh, and, and until somebody actually jumps up and punches George in the mouth, I'm going to continue to roll with the dogs. So uh, I expect this will definitely be one in George's favor as they push their win streak over Missouri to 10 games. Yeah, I mean, I, I like I said, I, I think there's a reality where Missouri wins this game, no doubt about it. Um, I think this is the toughest test Georgia's played all year. And if if Brady Cook and Luther Burden and those guys just come out and have a career game, wouldn't shock me if they win. I just think you're really going to have to ask Missouri to put together a really complete game. And for this defense to to that's been solid but a little inconsistent, you're going to have to ask them to be really good, certainly better than they were um, in the loss to LSU in which they gave up like 49 points or something like that. So, you know, I think I just don't quite buy it. Like you said, I think Georgia really might have something with Carson Beck. I think he's uh, looked very good. I think he's coming off probably what was the best game of his season. I think that might elevate this offense more than people are talking about. You know, I think Stetson Bennett was good for those teams, but he was also limited. I'm not sure Carson Beck is limited in the same ways. You know, I think he really is a, is a very good quarterback with a high ceiling. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the offseason goes if any of those quarterbacks behind Beck after watching him play decide to go elsewhere because they might have to wait another year uh, if Beck decides to to come back in, you know next year. Uh, but let's talk about a game that's got some implications. This is the storyline game of the week. Uh, Tyler, what are you looking for in the Washington-USC shootout that we're going to see on Saturday? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, there's there's Pac-12 implications here. You know, USC still hasn't lost a conference game, so they are, in theory, you know, still well, actually, in, in. They lost to Utah. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. My bad. They have one conference loss, so they are still theoretically in the. If sorry, I meant to say, if they win out, they still control their own destiny in the Pac-12. Yeah, my bad. Thanks for the correction there. So yeah, so point being, they still control their own destiny in the Pac-12. So they're still in there. I mean, this is still a really significant game for the uh, conference race in theory. I don't really think it is that significant, though. And, I, I, you know, I think the bigger deal here for me is what kind of game does Michael Penix Jr. have? Because if he has a huge game, I think he'll really solidify himself as the Heisman front runner. If not, you know, it really opens the door for someone like Jaden Daniels, who is right up there with him statistically, arguably even better and I think some people already see him as the, as the Heisman front runner. Um, I think if he wins against Alabama, you know, even if they don't win, if he has a great game, but especially if they do win and he has a great game and Michael Penix isn't great, like he had, you know, like he wasn't against Arizona state or they struggle as a team, like they did against Stanford. Maybe if they mess around and lose this game point being, I think to me, the main thing here is the Heisman, because I think that you could see, you could really see a clear leader after this week. I mean, I think we've been acting like it's Penix to this point. If he goes out and does it again, I think he will be the clear front runner. But like I said, if not, it could open the door for someone like a Jaden Daniels to get in the mix there. I will see your Michael Penix Jr. and raise you Alex Grinch. Uh, for me, looking at this game, especially over the last few weeks, USC has – one of the fourth worst scoring defenses, 43.7 points per game, which is a full 10 points a game more than they've been giving up all season. Obviously, there's a lot of frustration in Southern California based on how that defense is going. Fans are ready for Grinch to go. I know there's a lot of people ready for Grinch to go because of the pressure that is being mounted on this offense because their inability to stop people. And while Michael Penix Jr. hasn't looked great the last couple of weeks, you know, I think there was a rib issue or, or some sort of injury he sustained against Oregon, uh, perhaps a flu game. I've heard some rumors that he had a flu game last week against Arizona State. I don't know how true that is. But still, the fact that California was able to score as much as they did on this defense, I would not be surprised if Washington dropped 70 on this defense. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's certainly possible. I think 
things are tough looking tough for Alex Grinch. I'm not really sure there's a way out for him, honestly, at this point. Look, I, I like I don't really like to to come on here and publicly like call for someone to be fired for like especially for performance reasons. I mean, it's one thing if there's a scandal or something off the field or whatever, you know, then I then I won't really hesitate at Mel Tucker. But you know, I think with this in this case, I mean, truthfully, I Alex Grinch just should have been fired yesterday. Like, I mean, there's just no, he should have been fired probably before the season even started. You know, Lincoln really rolled the dice by bringing him back. Um, you know, Alex Grinch is his guy. He trusts his guy. I get that. Uh, but the results kind of speak for themselves at this point. And now Caleb Williams is moving on to the NFL. You've squandered this two year window with him at USC three year window with him overall. And most of that's because uh, Alex Grinch's defense has held you back. So, you know, it's going to be kind of, I think if they lose this game and continue to struggle defensively down the stretch, going to be some anxiety, I think, in LA about, you know, the way this season is gone and possibly, you know, could things have gone differently had Lincoln made a change at defensive coordinator like a lot of the fans wanted to coming into the year. Yep, absolutely. I'm We're in 100% agreement. And uh, I think this is, you know, defense optional in this game. Uh, we're going to see a lot of points, I think. I, I mean, I, I don't know what the over-under is, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was north of – if they combined for north of 100 points in this game. I, I wouldn't be surprised one bit. All right, so let's go to our final segment of the week. Let's go lock of the week. And I'm going to kick things off here, Tyler. I see Florida State just boat racing Pittsburgh. After losing 58-7 to last week to Notre Dame, Florida State's got a much better offense. Um, and, and you really – when you look at Keon Coleman – the guy, he's a highlight reel waiting to happen. So, for me, Florida State just rolling all over Pittsburgh, and it's not getting any better for Pat Narduzzi. Just out of curiosity, what, what's the threshold there for us to count that as, uh, as FSU rolling? How many points they got to win by? Uh, I would say at least 28. Okay. Yeah, I, that, I mean – no, I think that's – I mean, what, they lose by 51 last week to Notre Dame? Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. that's that's totally within the realm of possibility. Look – any chance I think that Pitt had of, of pulling something together here and, and stunning FSU in this game probably went out the window when, as we talked about Monday, Pat Narduzzi went out after the game and essentially uh, blamed the players and said they didn't have enough talent on the roster to win games. You know, you can act like I'm, I'm taking that out of context a little bit and blowing it out of proportion. Maybe that's the case, but the players certainly felt that way. Um, and just given, you know, their response – I'm not sure if this is a guy they're super fired up about playing for right now, especially coming into a game against one of the best teams in the country. So, yeah, I think that's a pretty safe bet. I would say I would say about four plus touchdowns is probably how that's going to end up going down. Uh, but but my lock of the week, I'm also sticking in the ACC or really, you know, half ACC. Uh, I've got. Notre Dame going on the road and beating Clemson pretty comfortably. I, the comfortably part is not part of the lock. They're just going to win the game. But look, I mean, Clemson at home is a hard team to beat and has been historically. I mean, prior to last season, they hadn't lost at home since 2016. Now they've lost at home twice in their last four or five home games. So that home field advantage has kind of dissipated. This team just is not there right now. It's pretty good defensively which I think will probably keep Notre Dame from like absolutely rolling in this game, like kind of in the way you're predicting for Florida state, but where things are with Kate Klubnick and this offense, it's not where it needs to be. The Garrett Riley change has not made nearly enough of an impact. Maybe that's just because Klubnick's not the answer. I still think it's a little too early to say that, um, but they don't have the weapons, you know, and their best weapon, Will Shipley, they're running back uh, currently in concussion protocol day to day may or may not play in this game. I don't think it's going to really make a difference regardless, but if they don't have Will Shipley, I don't really see any way that they can pull this out against a Notre Dame team that, like we said, playing really well right now, playing probably better than its record shows, may be a top 10 team in the country at the moment. Well, look at this matchup, Notre Dame versus Clemson. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay it out like this. I see Notre Dame as a team with a clear identity. We know what they are. They We know what they want to do. I got no clue with Clemson. What is your identity? Is defensive football, run the football? Or are you a pass team? I, it, it seems like it's a week-to-week change. I have no clue about the identity of the Clemson Tigers, and I think that's why they're struggling right now. That's why they're 4-4. Four and four. Worst record that they've had through eight games since 2010. Uh, I, I really don't. I don't have any idea, and that's why I'm going to agree with you. I, I Notre Dame over Clemson this week. 
yeah, you know, so they lose if, if they lose this game, they fall to four and five. Things get pretty dicey at that point. I mean, they've got remaining games. They got North Carolina. That's an, I mean, we have talked about I, I don't know what to make of this North Carolina team, but you still feel like they've got enough on offense to certainly at least give Clemson a good game. Um, and I, they've still got, you know, South Carolina, who sort of in the same boat, not that great of a team. But I mean, may, you know, maybe they can do something. And then I think they have Georgia Tech, too, which is. Again, I, I don't know what to make of that team, but they've looked good at times. Point being, I don't think there's any like given game left for this team. And if you're even questioning whether you're making a bowl game this year for Clemson, that's really, really tough for a team that, you know, going into this year out a 12 year stretch of winning double digit games, uh, you know, unprecedented situation could potentially be going down if they can't find a way to, to pull off the upset here. And now we understand why Dabo Sweeney was absolutely pissed off. Ed Tyler from Spartansburg uh, took out his frustrations on him. He didn't apologize for it. I don't think he should. I didn't necessarily think he was wrong. Maybe he just went wrong uh, with the way that he did it. Uh, but that's going to do it for this edition of the College 12 Pack. We're going to be back on Monday, wrap these games up, get you ready for another week, and uh, we'll see who takes advantage in the SEC and the Big 12 with these quote-unquote semifinals.